Um, up next, we will be having Dr. Swice from the University of Chicago come on and you will hear from Dr. Harmoth after Dr. Levine's talk right before the Nutrition and QOL Roundtable. The Nutrition and QOL, QOL Roundtable will now be 20 minutes instead of 30 minutes, um, so that is another adjustment. So I want to welcome Dr. Randy Swice. Uh, Dr. Swice is a medical oncologist at the University of Chicago with an expertise in the development of new cancer Im immunotherapies. Um, he's going to be talking about the latest for immunotherapy for solid tumors. Thank you for that intro introduction. It's been uh, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, to share some exciting uh, new areas of research. Let me just share my screen. I have some slides to uh, guide us to the discussion. So hopefully that's visible. So the topic of my uh, talk today is on updates on immunotherapy of solid tumors. I focus on uh, immunotherapeutic development in phase one clinical trials for solid tumors. And I do research in a laboratory investigating resistance to immune therapies. So uh, these are updates, but I'd like to start over a century ago where this topic really became um, of interest. Uh, this gentleman is a physician named William Coley who was alive in the late 19th century, early 20th century. And he was a surgeon in the New York area who was working on, uh, who would see lots of patients with sarcomas and would undergo these surgeries to resect sarcomas and was just frustrated by the um, recurrence rates and that patients would come back and, um, you know, die from their cancer, unfortunately, in spite of his uh, efforts at uh, removing these things surgically. So when he, uh, an initial observation was made that some patients who developed bacterial infections after surgery uh, actually um, seem to have a higher rate of cure or higher chances of uh, the cancer not coming back. So he made the connection that perhaps the immune system, the immune uh, response to the bacterial infection was actually having a secondary benefit in that it was um, able to control the cancer. And so this is really when uh, probably one of the first major links between cancer and the immune system against um, uh, were, were connected as a potential therapeutic. So uh, he took it a step further and said, I'm going to actually uh, inject patients with a bacterial concoction that was now we call Coley's toxin. Uh, he actually made in the lab and uh, treated patients by direct injection of bacteria into these cancers. And in fact, uh, reported 12 patients to be cured of this uh, group that some of which were injected intentionally, but others who developed infections incidentally after surgery. Um, unfortunately, uh, this was prior to the area of antibiotics, and this was uh, sort of an aggressive maneuver, and, and some patients developed um, sepsis and died from the infection itself. So this concept fell out of favor somewhat um, for many, many decades, uh, and especially as chemotherapies were developed and radiotherapy techniques were developed. And, um, you know, the, the concept kind of uh, fell out of favor uh, for, for decades until more recently. So um, I just want to give a brief overview. I don't want to get too much into the weeds, but uh, to understand how cancers can be recognized by the immune system. And effectively, uh, what can happen is tumor cell abnormal proteins can be seen by these immune cells that we call antigen presenting cells or dendritic cells. They see these abnormal proteins in tumors and they can actually trigger T cells, which are the cells that actually can do the killing of the tumor cells. Uh, they can actually trigger the uh, growth and activation of those cells, which can circulate back through the circulation, find the tumors and kill them. Now, clearly patients who develop cancer, uh, you know, in spite of this theoretical framework, so there must be defects somewhere along this pathway that allow cancer to grow. And one of the most important discoveries of the last 20 years has been the identification of what I call breaks on the immune system and the fact that tumors can exploit these breaks, uh, these proteins that are what we call checkpoints that can actually shut off the immune response and allow the tumor to grow. And this is a depiction of that. So tumor cells can express this protein called PDL1, which is at one of these breaks. And when the T cells that normally would wanna kill the tumor cell see that uh, protein express, it gives a signal to shut off. So you get these negative signals I'm showing here. There's another break called CTLA-4 that similarly can shut off T cells and other immune cells. 
Um, and so the, uh, therapy, the taking it to the next step, the therapeutic development over the last 15 years has been um, you know, around blocking these checkpoints. So what we call immune checkpoint inhibitors. These green uh, antibodies are shown as the drugs that we now have in our toolbox to kill cancer. And uh, they actually work not by killing cancer directly, but by unlocking this uh, immune cell response. And I like to tell patients, this is basically uh, the drugs cut the brakes and uh, allow the T cells to do their work and kill the tumor. So this is uh, quite a, seems quite simple, but actually took decades of research to understand these interactions and in fact led to the Nobel Prize in 2018. Jim Allison here in the United States, starting at Berkeley and then now at MD Anderson in Texas, uh, discovered that blocking uh, the CTLA-4 pathway could be used as a cancer therapeutic. And Tasuko Hanjo in Japan similarly um, really pioneered the use of uh, antibodies blocking PD-1 as another immune checkpoint. And both of these are now used in drugs that we have today for cancer. And uh, I wrote a book chapter in 2017 outlining uh, the use of these negative regulatory blockers or checkpoint blockers. And the FDA approvals at that time are shown here. As you can see, these strategies are working across many different cancers. Um, but what's, what's amazing is that I just updated this chapter for 2021 and, and this list has now grown probably triple or quadruple in size in terms of the number of cancers that we are now treating with immune checkpoint blockers. And it's, very, it's gotten so small, you can barely read it here. Uh, so that's great progress, um, but uh, unfortunately, what we know is that some patients with have cancers that are still resistant to blocking checkpoints. So we're trying to understand why some tumors don't. And appendix appendix cancer has actually been a challenging one in terms of immune therapy, um, because we know that even before you start treatment, some tumors, when you look at them under the microscope and you measure immune cells and other cells that are present, some have this type of phenotype where you see the proliferation, the growth and um, tumor cells uh, growing rapidly without any uh, reaction by the immune system, even before therapy. But some, even before you give the immune therapy, they have this sort of pre-existing immune response. We call them T-cell inflamed but it's not functional enough. And so the cancer still grows, but when you give the checkpoint blocker, it can actually cause these cells to start working. And, and those patients that have these type of tumors tend to have better responses. And uh, colorectal cancers and appendix cancers tend to be more of this type on the left, which is uh, harder to treat with immune therapies. And that's where our efforts are now focused on trying to develop new drugs. And so um, when you think about why tumors have these different immune responses or why the patient's immune systems respond differently to tumors, there can be three general uh, categories of effects. And one can be perhaps the patient's immune system that they're born with. Uh, some are more likely to react uh, strongly to a tumor, some are not. So inherited genes, which uh, may be um, things that we can actually uh, modulate in the future with different therapies, um, or it could be the tumor itself has figured out other mechanisms to block the response. And then certainly there are other things like diet, the probiotic microbiome that are, is present in the body that can interface with the immune, immune response that can influence in a good or a bad way, the immune response against cancer. So in order to circumvent some of the other resistance pathways, there are new strategies that we're developing and really they're aimed at uh, inflaming these non-inflamed tumors as we describe. And some involve, uh, we have a number of clinical trials now doing direct injection into the tumor. So rather than giving an IV drug um, or a pill, uh, we're actually using um, either things that we can do directly in the clinic if they're close to the surface of the skin, or we have a establishing protocols with our interventional radiologists that can inject deeper lesions, um, or even our surgeons who can go in and do um, some procedures that might inject tumors directly with agents that essentially inflame these tumors that can convert the immune response to more of an inflamed tumor. And, and, and there's a whole long list of these drugs that are in uh, trial development now, and we're hoping that some of these strategies will pan out. Uh, secondly, there's a new category of therapies that are what we call bi or tri specifics. And uh, what that means is you have a, a drug or a protein scaffold that basically can connect with two things. So you have an antibody that can say here on the top, this is connecting with a tumor antigen. So it's actually uh, the drug recognizes one of the abnormal proteins that tumors make. 
Um, and in, that can be any protein you design it to, to target. And uh, the other end of it that's connected actually connects with T cells or immune cells that I said are good for killing tumors. So this literally mechanically will draw T cells towards the tumor and we inject this IV or subcutaneously and it sort of circulates throughout the body and it can actually uh, lead to immune responses in tumors that haven't historically had immune responses or those non-inflamed tumors. Uh, there is a drug uh, that is in, uh, has a positive phase three that is likely to get approved in uveal melanoma very soon, uh, a disease in which uh, typically doesn't respond to those immune checkpoint blockers. So this strategy is working. These other ones on the bottom are similar. Um, one might envision an antibody that binds a tumor uh, protein, but is connected to a chemotherapy. We call those antibody drug conjugates. And there are a number that are FDA approved now that actually can deliver chemotherapy in a smarter way directly to the tumor so you get less side effects and, um, and, and also uh, maybe have better tumor kill. And, and this has actually been successful in many cancers like breast cancer and urothelial cancer, bladder cancer. Uh, you can also connect it to other uh, antibodies that pull in uh, different immune cells uh, or um, you know whatever target of interest. This technology is really... Uh, been developed over 20 years to uh, target two or three things, maybe hit more than one immune checkpoint. As I said in the beginning, there are actually more than one um, of these breaks. And so maybe blocking a couple or two or three of these breaks at the same time can be helpful. And then lastly, CAR T cells, which I have a next slide on, which shows, um, you know, bypass all of these block blocking uh, steps um, that cancers can exploit by simply taking a patient's own T cells or immune cells and modifying them in the laboratory to be hyperactive against a particular tumor and then injecting them back in. And this has been very successful and now approved in hematologic malignancies like lymphoma leukemia and uh, is moving quickly into solid tumors. And we hope to see success in solid tumor cancers there too. This is uh, quite impressive. This is basically a living drug that is your own uh, immune system that's uh, modified and can actually stay alive and continue to surveil uh, for cancer in the body afterwards. Um, so that's a, a third strategy. So really in summary, it's a, uh, you know, I don't have a lot of time. I'd love to go into a lot more detail, but uh, you know, in summary, the immune system can recognize and kill cancer cells. We know that now, um, but we know that tumors evade that through different techniques uh, and uh, have evolved to sort of uh, block that immune response. So we use newer immunotherapies to unlock the body's immune system to fight cancer. And this strategy um, has a number of advantages. I list two important ones here. One is the immune system is very specific. So once you unlock this, it actually uh, recognizes that tumor cell very specifically, meaning it's less likely to cause um, its side effects on normal cells. Um, whereas things like chemotherapy really affect cancer cells and also normal cells. Um, and so that's one of the downsides of other uh, non-immune therapies. But immune therapies are very precise and they target the tumor. And also uh, that even after you stop treating with some of these immune uh, checkpoint blockers, for instance, the responses can often be long lived because once you trigger that immune response, it's really your body that is the drug and it's not so much uh, the drug itself. The drug is uh, just unlocking your own body's uh, immune response. So, uh, but you know, these newer strategies are very exciting, but obviously we've got a lot of work to do and a lot of patients are still not responding. And so we have new strategies that are in development and likely coming in the next few years. Some already are here, CAR T cells being one of them, um, but then also some of these molecules that directly activate the immune system in tumors and allow more patients to respond. So I um, wanna thank you for your time and um, uh, happy to take questions at the time when it's available.